Tonight, a conversation between two lawmakers, one Republican and one Democrat, about some of the biggest issues of the day. And as we head into this election year, our hope is that we get to have an honest debate about the direction that our country should follow. So we want to welcome this evening's Newsnight debate, New York Democrat Jamal Bowman and New York Republican Mike Lawler, thank you both for joining us. And before we get to these issues, I do want to start with some news. The House uh, just censured you, Congressman Bowman, today, 214 to 191. Uh, the inciting incident was when uh, the congressman set off a fire alarm in the middle of a fight to avert a government shutdown uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, congressman Bowman, uh, Adam Schiff, your colleague, when he was censured, he said that it was a badge of honor. Do you think it's a badge of honor? <laughs> Well, it's another example of how the Republican Party is not serious about governing. Uh, they have no ideas. They have no policies. They can't ex inspire the American people. So they focused on censuring me, even though uh, after the fire alarm incident, I took full responsibility right away. Uh, the legal process is playing itself out. And if all things go well, the case will be completely dismissed uh, in January. I uh, have to pay a fine. Ethics at the moment is not moving forward. Uh, so, you know, once again, the party is focused on censures and, and you know, uh, culture wars and messaging and not focused on governing for the American people. So it's unfortunate. I should know, Congressman Lawler, you voted in favor of the censure. I, I, I guess I should ask, I mean, he took responsibility just then and, and before. Uh, is that punishment, even though the censure has no real consequences, but is that fitting to the, uh, the crime that he, he committed here? Yes. Uh, with all due respect to, to my colleague here, uh, he pulled a fire alarm uh, intentionally. Uh, he can try to uh, say that it was not uh, or that he made a mistake. He thought the fire alarm would open a door. He was a middle school principal. He certainly understands the difference between a locked door uh, and a fire alarm. He ran by seven Capitol Hill police officers after the alleged mistake and didn't say a word. He only spoke to them once a bolo went out and they went and found him uh, and started inquiring about it. So with all due respect, uh, this was not a mistake. Uh, it was intentional. The Democrats were playing shenanigans that day, doing single line uh, voting, single file line voting, uh, using paper cards rather than their electronic cards to delay the vote on a continuing resolution. Uh, and so there needs to be accountability. Last week, I took on a member of my own party, along with Anthony D'Esposito. We introduced a resolution to expel George Santos because he was unfit to serve. Uh, so if Mr. Bowman and others are happy to expel George Santos, uh, at the very least, there should be accountability. A censure is saying you did wrong. And that's what happened today. I don't want to belabor this point, but as you can see, my Republican colleague is trying to get into my head and articulate my state of mind, despite my multiple consistent comments to the contrary, despite me not being charged for disrupting uh, a congressional proceeding. And remember, this is a vote to keep the government open. So in a rush to get there, yes, I ran past many Capitol Police officers, so you deny, but I was trying to you, get there. You unequivocally deny that this was an attempt to delay that vote. Absolutely not. I just want to make a point. The video evidence speaks for itself. I don't need to get in your head. The video shows you threw the signs on the floor. You tried opening the door. It didn't open. You went and pulled the fire alarm. You ran by seven Capitol Hill police officers. That is not a mistake. And it took you an hour, by the way, to get to the floor to go vote. So don't say you were in a rush to go vote when you weren't. Let's get to the more important issues, please. But again, to this point, only some of the video was rele released, not the entire video. So he's only speaking from a small percentage of what he saw. Congressman, stand by. We'll discuss the rise of anti-Semitism on college campuses as one university president's job is on the brink tonight. Last night, there was a Republican primary debate, and uh, arguably one of the uh, most stunning episodes came when one of the candidates, Vivek Ramaswamy, invoked the great replacement theory on that stage. Uh, we've seen also these college presidents come before Congress, and they were asked to 
uh, to state unequivocally that calls for genocide are not acceptable on their college campuses. Do you think both parties right now have a problem with anti-Semitism in their ranks? Look, the vitriol and hatred that we are seeing across this country, uh, the anti-Semitism on college campuses in the halls of Congress is disgusting. Uh, and everyone should be held to account for it. Uh, the fact is uh, that those uh, college administrators should all be fired, every last one of them, that they couldn't say that calling for the gen uh, genocide of Jews on their campuses uh, violated their conduct. In fact, some of them said it's context. It needs to turn into action. Are you calling for the actual genocide of Jews? You want them to be killed first before you take action on your campuses? I introduced a resolution uh, on the House floor that made it very clear that Israel has a right to exist. Because if you look at the terrorist attack of October 7th, uh, it's clear Hamas uh, and its backer, Iran, do not believe Israel has a right to exist. They want to eliminate the Jewish people, period. And so we need to be unequivocal and clear. There is no moral equivalency here. This is good versus evil. Hamas is a terrorist organization that has oppressed the Palestinian people, that has used them as human shields. So if we want to combat anti-Semitism, not only do we need to take it on on our college campuses and in the halls of Congress, but we need to make it very clear that terrorist organizations like Hamas and its funder and backer, Iran, that we do not support that at all, that we stand by Israel, and very clear-eyed, we believe in Israel's right to exist, its right to defend itself, and the right of the Jewish people to practice their faith. First of all, if there is anti-Semitism in Congress, it is coming from the Republican Party, not the Democratic Party, number one. Number two, I introduced a resolution condemning the Great Replacement Theory as a freshman in Congress for the first time in history that had been done and that resolution passed because we had a democratically controlled House. Not one Republican voted for my resolution condemning the Great Replacement Theory. So once again, they are not serious about addressing the issue of anti-Semitism. They are not serious about addressing, addressing the issue of racism or Islamophobia. They are not serious about governing. Absolutely, we condemn the Hamas attacks of October 7th. Absolutely. Absolutely. Then we why condemn. did you vote against a resolution? To Absolutely. Do that? I made my own statement condemning Hamas. Absolutely, we condemn uh, any calls for genocide of our Jewish brothers and sisters or any group of people. But what my colleague just did was conflate criticisms of Israel with anti-Semitism, yeah. and that is incorrect. Let me, just, let me just finish this point. A criticism of a state, the state of Israel, any other state, doesn't mean you criticize the people that that state claims to represent. Really fighting anti-Semitism is doing the work in terms of education, engagement, connecting communities, and learning what it is and how to do something well, about it. I just it. want to be specific here because one of the issues at hand here is this phrase, from the river to the sea, right? This is something that was spoken by your colleague, Rashida Tlaib. It's something that is chanted on some of these college campuses. That is a phrase that Jewish people believe is a call for the genocide of Jewish people. Do you think that that should be something that is off limits in the halls of Congress and on college campuses? It is not a phrase that I use. Uh, it is not something I subscribe to. And it is something that absolutely needs to be addressed. Do you addressed. believe that it's a call for genocide? It's not a phrase I use because I know many of my Jewish brothers and sisters believe that it is. So I don't want to encroach upon what they feel that is. And I don't even use the phrase. So what I'm saying is, when we talk about dealing with anti-Semitism, condemnation of a phrase or an action is not enough. The Republican Party is looking to cut, let me finish, looking to cut the Department of Education. They're looking to cut the Department of Civil Rights. They're looking to cut the departments where you actually address the issue of anti-Semitism. And then lastly, we can't deal with anti-Semitism in and of itself without also addressing the issue of Islamophobia. Many of my Muslim 
and Arab and Palestinian constituents and people all across the city, state and country feel completely erased and dehumanized, not only by the Republican Party, but, but by many members of Congress. And we got to stop having one side of the conversation without the other, because what happens is it continues to exacerbate anti-Semitism. I just want to respond to that for a second. From the river to the sea is anti-Semitic, period. You sound like the college uh, administrators the other day in the hearing trying to put context around it. Mm -hmm. There's no context for it. Calling for the eradication of the Jewish people is a genocide. And that is exactly what these folks are doing when they're chanting from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. I want the Palestinian people to be free from their oppressors, Hamas, the Palestinian Authority. Hamas has used the Palestinian people as human shields for years, killing them using hospitals, using schools as, as a vehicle to launch attacks against Israel. Are you going the to Palestinian listen, authority, excuse not, me, I didn't not, interrupt you. Do not you. try the to Palestinian frame this conversation the as Palestinian if someone authority is giving Hamas cover. The respect. The what Palestinian do authority Don't say what, what pays he's doing. Palestinians. He's saying, pays Palestinians ahead, I'll let you to, finish. The Palestinian authority pays Palestinians to kill Jews. Is that not wrong? Of course it's okay. wrong. We passed the Taylor Force Act five years ago. This administration is failing to enforce that. In fact, giving the Palestinian Authority funding. Hamas is a terrorist organization. If you want a ceasefire in Gaza, there's a very simple way. Join me in calling for Hamas to surrender. They should surrender right now. They should turn over all of the remaining hostages and they should free the Palestinian people from their control. They have been the governing body in Gaza for over 15 years. They have oppressed the Palestinian people. You made but your you point. called Israel, you said what Israel is doing defending itself, you said it, they're committing a genocide in Gaza. Is that what you believe? Yeah. Do you believe, as some of your colleagues have said, what Israel is doing in Gaza is a genocide? It is a mass murder. It is a war crime. What is happening in, in Gaza right now? You talk about Hamas having control over the Palestinians in Gaza. There has been a blockade of Gaza for several years. The people in Gaza cannot leave one way or the other. The water, the food, the energy is controlled by Israel. So do not say one side of it, Hamas is controlling its own people. And I agree with you, the people of Gaza do not want that without leaving out the Israel blockade. And then why don't you ever speak about the occupation of the West Bank and settlement expansion in the West Bank in the number of 700,000 settlers right now. Do you support a two-state solution? Look, I would Do love, you I support would, a two-state solution? Would, I would love to see a two-state solution, which okay. is why I introduced the special envoy for the Abraham Accords. Have you Accords condemned because, the occupation? Which is why I introduced the special Have envoy for the Abraham the Accords. Because not, you if harm. you want to, if you want to bring peace, if you want a two-state solution, and you want to bring peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis, you need to normalize relations between Arab majority countries and Israel. And the, the only way you do that is if people accept a simple premise Have that Israel has a right. To exist. Have you ever that been Israel to the West Bank? Has a right to exist. I've been to Jerusalem. Have Israel you been to the West Bank? Right to See, exist. we have. So, this is what You're happens. Well, let me. Let this me, is what happens. what happens. What you, happens? What do you mean with all due respect? Well, what you are speaking what? with a sense of authority, as if yep. you've been there. You have never been right. to the West Bank. You okay. have never been stopped at a checkpoint. Right. You have never spoken to the people in the West Bank, in Hebron, in Ramallah. You haven't seen the water tanks at the top of their homes that they have to preserve just in case Israel cuts off the water, man. Well, let me so let you, me follow up. Let, let me follow up. You let me follow up. Congressman Lawler, let me follow up on that for just a second because I want to I want people to understand what you're talking about here. Just in the span of weeks since October 7th, uh, there has been a spike in settler violence against Palestinians in the West Bank that the Biden administration has been trying to address. Do you believe that there should be more done by the Israeli government to curb that in the interest of peace? Oh, no, there should be no civilian violence at all. We do not want innocent civilians getting harmed, getting killed, whether they be Israelis or Palestinians. I think the challenge in all of this is, you know, 
a lot of my colleagues call for a ceasefire, including Jamal. There have been eight ceasefires in 15 years, each time violated by Hamas. So if you are the Israeli government, and October 7th, the largest slaughtering of Jews since the Holocaust, are you supposed to sit back and wait for it to happen again? You are you supposed to? I do are you supposed to? It's collective punishment. But Jamal, this is what you That's seem against not to grasp. Law. Hamas, we have 1.8 million Hezbollah, refugees. Iran believe Israel does not have a right to exist. This is Are you waiting Gaza. for the full-on genocide to this happen? Is, this is are you, Gaza. Are you waiting for them to be completely there eliminated? There are 1.8 million refugees in Gaza. Okay. This is collective punishment. They cut immediately cut they off have food, been, water, have been energy, starvation in Gaza. Government. I'm talking about right now. They have been now. oppressed by their I'm own government about for over since 15 October years. October 7th. I, if I'm you talking want about since October peace, 7th. if you want a ceasefire, Hamas must surrender. Even on this most recent short-term ceasefire to it, to turn over the hostages, they violated it. They violated it. Mm -hmm. So how do you expect Israel to be able to negotiate and deal with them when Hamas refuses to accept the terms of a ceasefire? Stand by for us. We still have even more ahead with the two of you. Coming up next for us is the United States Congress now on the verge of not sending money to another war zone in Ukraine. We'll discuss that as President Biden calls the standoff to gift a gift to Vladimir Putin. More now on our Newsnight conversation with Democrat Jamal Bowman and Republican Mike Lawler. The topic now, Ukraine, some suggest that Ukraine is losing this war to Putin. And the United States uh, is now asking for even more money, the, the Biden administration asking for more money from Congress. Uh, your party is pushing back on that hard. Do you think that the money that is being sent over to Ukraine is well spent? So my wife is from Moldova. Her family lives on the Ukraine border. Uh, and I have been concerned from the very beginning that if Ukraine were to fall uh, and Vladimir Putin successful, that Moldova would be next. And the foreign minister made that clear just last week. Uh, so I have supported uh, funding for Ukraine uh, and will continue to do so. The challenge that we have here is that the Biden administration refuses to negotiate on critical issues such as securing our own border. So while I do believe in providing funds to Ukraine to secure their borders and protect their sovereignty, we need to do the same here in America. Since Joe Biden took office, Nearly 10 million migrants have c crossed our southern border, many of them illegally. Uh, the asylum process is fundamentally broken, taking two to three years for these cases to be heard. And when they are heard, nearly two thirds rejected. New York City is facing an existential threat. Eric Adams said the migrant crisis is destroying New York. They're f talking about cutting funding for police and fire and emergency services. Joe Biden needs to get serious about securing our border. What we have said in the House Republican majority is that we will support Ukraine, but it needs to be tied to real changes in border security policy. In addition, Chuck Schumer has done absolutely nothing. He has passed nothing through the Senate. He's the Senate majority leader from New York. He has done nothing on the border, nothing on Israel. He's the highest ranking Jewish official in America has not passed one thing to provide aid to Israel. The House passed it in a bipartisan way weeks ago. What is Chuck Schumer doing? I'll, I'll let you respond. So our, the challenges at the border and how we process the migrants that come into our country was destroyed by Donald Trump, not President Biden. That's number one. Number two, Democrats have been pushing and fighting for true immigration, comprehensive immigration reform, Republicans have stopped it for decades. We are a nation of immigrants. We welcome them when they are coming seeking asylum, and we will continue and should continue to do that. And we must meet them with humanity and care to make sure that they are able to contribute to our economy in the way that they want to. With regard to the Ukraine, I have supported um, continuing to support Ukraine. What I'm hearing in my district is tremendous frustration because we seem to always have 
hundreds of billions of dollars for war and conflict and mass murder and suffering, but we don't have the same hundreds of billions of dollars for affordable housing, for child care, for education, for health care. And we never, ever, 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 ever have a conversation about reparations for black Americans. So are your constituents they growing tired? They're going to the of, side. Yes. Are, they're growing they tired are very frustrated country. because we solve every conflict with militarism as opposed to diplomacy. We have to find diplomatic political solutions to war all over the world, and we need to invest those hundreds of billions of dollars into uplifting the humanity of people on, here in our country. On immigration, Congressman yeah. Lawler, just, just to follow up on what a Congressman Bowman said, why won't Republicans simply come to the table with a actual plan to negotiate on the overall immigration system and border security by itself. Well, with all due respect. I mean, that's an option with, with, that is available. With all due respect, Republicans are the only ones that have actually passed anything on border security no, this I, year. No, I'm talking about we passed, taking, we taking passed this, HR. I'm, I'm going to answer what, your he, question. what he was asking, I, about, which I is a comprehensive approach. But, but the border is a, a, an immediate crisis. Have you been to the border? Not yet. The border is an the immediate crisis. The man hasn't crisis. been to the West Bank. He hasn't been to the border. Jo but you're Jamal. speaking like an expert on both. Well, Jamal, I've with all due respect. I've been to the border. Uh, and, and is I've it going well? I've been to Laredo, Texas. And is the border going well? I met well? with CBP. And is the border going I've well? I met with FEMA and down there. And what did there. CBP tell you? They told they you told that it is that not working. They told me that 95... They've come and testified listen, numerous I'm, I'm going to answer your question. Excuse me. It was my They it told me that 95% of the people they... Bring so, in are not look, criminals. That's what they let told me. Let, him, let, let me, me let, 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 let me actually finish. finish. Thank you. So here's the issue: the border is the immediate crisis. We passed HR two, the Secure the Border Act. Democrats in the Senate have done absolutely nothing on this. I introduced, along with a bipartisan group from the House, the Dignity Act which would not only deal with the border, it would deal with the undocumented, and it would fix our legal immigration system. It's the first bipartisan piece of legislation in over a decade on immigration reform. Immigration reform has not occurred since 1986, the year I was born. Now, I look at this and, and see it that it is one of the greatest challenges we have in this country, because as Jamal said, immigrants do enrich our communities, our culture, our economy. As our population declines, we need immigrants in this country. We welcome them. But there has to be a process, and it has to be done legally. To just allow 10 million migrants to flood the southern border and act as though that's not a problem. And if you've been there, I can't understand why you would not vote in favor of legislation to secure the border. We have to deal with this. This is not about being against immigration. As I said before, my wife is an immigrant. You want to I have been Please through this process. You have the last I have been through this process. It is a fundamentally broken one. Okay. But if we're going to secure the border of other countries, we better start by securing our own border. Congressman Bowman, last question. Yeah, so you want to secure the border with more police. I'm saying we need... No, more... we need more court personnel uh, to correct. handle these asylum yes. cases. So we need more judges. That's what the Dignity Act does. Why don't you sign on And to a it? lot more police. We Why need... don't you sign on to we need more judges. We need more um, counselors and social workers. We need more lawyers to help with the processing. And we need more investment in FEMA. That's number one. If you go to the border, you will have a more holistic perspective as to what's happening there. So stop writing bills about places you've never been, number <laughs> okay, one. Jamal. Number two, I didn't just go to the border. I've also gone to Central and South America. I went to Guatemala and Honduras to meet the, with the indigenous people there to learn about what is happening. Why does mass migration keep happening? You know what's happening? Multinational corporations are coming in, supported by America and the West, to destroy the ecosystems of these communities. That's why poverty is so high. That's why there's no education system. They're left helpless and hopeless, and that's why they it, come to the U.S. It's fascinating to watch and you blame America we, for all the world. America needs to take some it responsibility. It is fascinating to watch you. You know My what? My men, You're, we you, are fathers. You, the number one who lesson are complaining to me, about being the number censured one lesson today is talking about taking kids. responsibility, take respo America, and yet you blame gentlemen. America for every single problem in the world. We have it's to leave it there. We got Western hegemony. Gentlemen, we, not we have to leave it there. This? We have to leave it there. Uh, more of our special news night debate. Do Republicans plan to go along with Donald Trump's demand to do away with Obamacare? That's next.
And welcome back to our Newsnight debate, a conversation between lawmakers about the issues that matter. Now turning to maybe the most important issue for Americans across the country, and that is health care. Congressman Lawler, uh, recently Donald Trump said that he had a plan to repeal and replace Obamacare. Again, Republicans have been down this road before. Is this really uh, something that he can do since he's failed to do it before? Well, obviously, during his uh, administration, they attempted to, and as you point out, didn't didn't pass. Uh, I don't see uh, Obamacare being repealed at this point, uh, certainly not in its entirety. I think we do need to look at how to improve uh, the quality of care. We need to look at how to improve access uh, to insurance. Um, and we need to look at how to reduce cost. Uh, Obamacare clearly has not reduced cost uh, when it comes to health care. Uh, in fact, health care costs are at record highs. And when I go out and talk to folks across my district, uh, people are feeling the pain of that. And while I think health care is certainly uh, one of the most important issues facing the country, I think immigration uh, is a major issue, including our southern border. I think housing is a major issue. I sit on the financial services uh, committee and, and the housing subcommittee. Uh, so there are a lot of issues pertaining to affordability, to, pertaining to our economy. Uh, health care is a major part of it. When you have insurance companies owning uh, health care providers, um, that is frankly disturbing. I think that we need to reevaluate how some of this uh, is operating within the healthcare space um, and how we provide more access. We also have a shortage of doctors, of nurses, of home health aides. That all plays a role, and that's why I brought up immigration. We have to deal with this holistically. Yeah. So, Congressman Bowman, roughly three in five Americans now uh, favor. Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act. They they like the pre-existing conditions. They uh, they have gotten used to the law as it is. But you support a Medicare for all system. Do you still think that that is something that should be on the table? Oh, absolutely. Uh, we need even we, though most Americans are seem to be comfortable. With most the Americans want to be able to go to the doctor when they're sick and not have to pay for it. So whatever that looks like is what I'm game for. Our uh, caucus and myself, we support universal health care. We support Medicare for all because we spend more than other developed countries on health care and we're not as healthy uh, as a nation. So Trump is not going to be successful in rolling back Obamacare. One, because Democrats are going to have control of the House and the Senate, which is going to make it much more difficult uh, for him to do that if he were to get in. And I don't think he's going to get in, but we'll leave that on the side. But in terms of uh, much of what my colleague said about health care, I agree with. One thing I want to add to it, um, you know, he mentioned housing, which I 100 percent agree with, and he mentioned a holistic approach, which I 100 percent agree with. We have to talk about the predeterminants of health and the things that we need to invest in that will help us to dramatically bring down health care costs like universal child care and early childhood education. Many of our babies, our children, are dealing with toxic stress and chronic trauma because we don't have a universal child care system. And many of my colleagues in the Republican Party do not support universal child care. But that social determinant of health, in addition to housing, in addition to other environmental factors like climate and education, will help, help with health care outcomes on the back end as well. I, I would just note, under uh, this administration and the Democrat-controlled Congress, uh, during the first two years. They increased spending by $5 trillion in new spending. It gave us record inflation. We are staring down $34 trillion in debt. Uh, universal health care, uh, you know, Medicare for all, uh, would absolutely destroy our economy. No. There is no way for us to pay for that. Uh, and <laughs> what's... How, how do you propose we to pay for it? We spend $900 billion a year to build to weapons of mass destruction. How do you propose to pay for it? And mean? by the way, what's the price tag on it? Do you have a price tag on it? So corporate wealth tax, corporate tax, raise those. Wealth tax, raise, it raise to that. What? Raise it to a number that's doable and feasible. By any means necessary, we need to make sure everyone has health care. Here's the other thing. If people are healthier, 
easy to go to the doctor, go to the doctor for their mental health needs, what have you, they are able to contribute more to our economy. I mean, the problem with our health care system is it's based on, an, on a free market capitalist system. And when you're looking to cut costs, people are going to die like 70,000 per year right now because we have a market-based system. If we had a system where those people can get the health care they need and the dental and the optical and the, and the hearing uh, care they need, but they can contribute you, more to society. How do you control those costs? What do you mean? If you're covering everything and you, the government is paying for everything, how do you keep the costs from continuing to go up? Well, get us off of a, mar a market-based system. If we had a single-payer system, public, publicly funded with our tax dollars, you can keep the cost low. Look at the IRA. So we passed the IRA, again, Democrats passed the IRA, not Republicans. We already brought down insulin costs for seniors to $35 a month. We brought down insulin costs for everyone, and we could finally negotiate drug prices with pharmaceutical companies that are crooks and ripping people off. And so we are already beginning to control costs because the government has the opportunity to negotiate prices. What's your solution to the cost issue? You raised it earlier. How, how to bring costs down for consumers if you favor a, a market-based system? Well, I absolutely favor a market-based system. I do not support uh, socialism. I do not support uh, the universal health plan. The market uh, will not save us. I do not support the universal health plan. This is not a binary. My, my colleague supports. Uh, at the end of the day, you have to look at this uh, on a number of fronts. So as people are aging in place, we want them to be able to age in their home. If they are having medical issues, uh, if they don't need emergency room care, if they don't need long-term care, we want them to be able to age in their home. So you have to deal with the employment issues in this country because we need more home health aides. We need more nurses. We need more doctors. That's why I introduced the Conrad 100 to allow for each state to provide a waiver for up to 100 doctors to stay here uh, on, on their visa. We appreciate the lively, animated conversation. Uh, I know that the two of you can have this conversation in this way, but still have respect for each other. Congressman Mike Lawler, Congressman Jamal Bowman, thank you both very much for joining us for all of that.